Good evening, everyone. Hello to all my American friends and listeners, and good morning to everyone listening in Australia. It's such a privilege to talk to you each week, and I get such a buzz coming on the show. Just remember, if you've got any questions during the show, just po- jump onto W4WN, pop them in the top bottom right hand corner, or tweet us at W4WN Radio. I'm your host, Tony Londis. Don't forget to jump onto my social media and like, follow, and comment. Radio Tony now has its own Facebook, and I'd love to be friends with you. So I've got a website that gives you lots of information, and it's www.tonylontis.com. So I'm glad that you could all join me again this week because we've got another jam-packed show. I've had a busy week, and yesterday I got to interview the most amazing person for my upcoming TV series, Tony TV. Her name was Donna Lee Perfect, and she's a survivor of childhood domestic violence and trauma. She spent a large part of her teenage years living with a schizophrenic, alcoholic murderer, her father. She also spent time in approximately 13 different foster homes and families. And after surviving all of this, she went on to become a life line suicide prevention counsellor, an international business owner, an expert on resilience, bullying and domestic violence. She does inspirational work with a travelling children's show called The Dream Guards Tour of Resilience. She also in, is involved in the Perfect Peace Program and the Dream Guards Ambassador Program. She's currently on a mission to create the largest gratitude chain link in the world to create a Guinness World Record. The chain's made of paper laminated loops with thousands of messages of gratitude and she wants each of us to take a moment and write down today something that we are grateful for. So here's how you can be involved. On a strip of white paper or coloured paper, approximately 6 centimetres by 21 centimetres, so that's about 2.5 inches by 8 and a quarter inches uh, in length. Write on the paper strip what you're grateful for and put your name on it. And then you post it to Donna at P.O. Box 70, Barsity Lakes, Queensland, 4227 Queensland. And she's got a Facebook page called the Global Gratitude Chain. And if you want more information and those of our US listeners who want to get involved because it's a worldwide movement, the Facebook page is called the Global Gratitude Chain. Donna's dream is to take that amazing chain on the Alan DeGeneres DeGeneres show and I think we should all get on board and help her with that. So a big shout out to Donna today. I'll pop those details in the chat box when I get a moment and I encourage you to get on board and let's raise the vibration of the world to one of gratitude. Over to what's making news this week before I introduce our amazing guest this week, Bren Blankenship. Uh, Before I do, though, Willow wants to know, why did she go to so many foster homes? Well, Donna, at the age of seven, witnessed the murder of her mother at the hands of her father. And so when her father was charged and sent to jail, the family of five was split up and sent to different foster homes. And as many of you probably are aware, that often foster homes are not a permanent solution and the children get moved around here, there and everywhere um, over the course of time. And so she spent lots of time in these different foster homes Um, and I won't go too much more into Donna's story because I will have her on the radio show um, soon. So over to what's making news before I introduce Bren. Um, Economists calculate monetary value of thoughts and prayers. A US study finds Christians are willing to pay for prayers but atheists will pay to avoid them. It said All things have a price, and if not, economists will find one. Researchers have calculated the going rate for thoughts and prayers offered in hard times. 
Rather than settling on one price for all, the study found the value of a compassionate gesture depended overwhelmingly on a person's beliefs. While Christian participants of the study were willing to part with money to receive thoughts and prayers from others, the idea made non-believers balk. Instead in Instead of shelling out to receive the gestures, on average, they were willing to pay to avoid them. So the economist Linda Thonstrom, an author of the study at the University of Wyoming, said it was a big surprise. Atheists and agnostics, that's those people who don't believe in anything higher than humans, are actually willing to give up money to avoid people's thoughts and prayers. The other participant in the study and co-collaborator Suri Noy, a sociologist from Denison University in Ohio, decided to put a value on thoughts and prayers to help understand the backlash that often follows when prominent figures express their sympathies to communities affected by catastrophes such as mass shootings and natural disasters. To some critics, the words are meaningless and at worst, detract from the practical action that might help prevent further disasters. The study, published in the Journal of Proceedings of National Academy of Science, focused on 436 residents of North Carolina, the state most affected by Hurricane Florence last year. The participants were given $5 in support of their hardship and asked how much, if any, they were willing to exchange to receive thoughts and gestures and prayers from strangers, most of whom were recruited over the internet. When a participant agreed to a price for a gesture, one of the strangers received a note outlining the participant's struggles and asking them for either prayer or to have them in their thoughts. Prayers from a priest were worth $7.17 to the average Christian in need. Prayers from less exalted Christians were valued at $4.36, while mere thoughts from another Christian were cheaper still at $3.27. The researchers used the statistical models to estimate prices people would pay above the $5 they had. Atheists and agnostics, meanwhile, were adverse to thoughts and prayers. On average, they were willing to pay a priest $1.66 not to pray for them, and more than twice that, at $3.54, to ensure a run-of-the-mill Christian similarly refrained. Public figures increasingly face criticism criticism for the language around tragedies. It may reflect the political climate we are in, the researchers said. Some of these people might feel that they hear the phrase thoughts and prayers all the time, and perhaps it provokes something in them. The Harvard Law professor Cass Sundreen, who was the administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs under Barack Obama, called the study a strong and powerful paper. In the aftermath of the mass shooting in Las Vegas in 2017, Mark Kelly, husband of the Arizona Democrat Gabby Guilfords, who survived a shooting as a constituent meeting in 2011, rallied against politicians for their failure to address what he had called the epidemic of gun violence in the US. What we're hearing today from Capitol and White House are thoughts and prayers, he said. Thoughts and prayers aren't going to stop the next shooting, Only action and leadership will do that. The researchers said this this work and research helps us understand the contemporary heated debate about these gestures. What our results show is that they have real value to some people, but not to others. These gestures need to be more targeted. If you're talking to a population that is more dominated by non-believers than believers, you might not want to suggest a National Prayer Day. So Leo wants to know, where does the money go? Well, I believe the purpose of the study was to have a nominal amount, and that was $5. And the $5 you could use to pay a priest to pray for you, or if you're a non-believer, you can keep that $5 to help in your situation. So I actually find that quite fascinating research today. 
Um, and David wants to know, don't think anyone actually sent money for the prayers. This may have been uh, just a study. I actually think that the study was fully funded, i.e. they did have that little amount of money to spend and see what the results were. That's usually the case with university-based research. It's fully funded. So, before we get on to a break, I want to tell you about our guest today. Bryn is a, an ex-actress, and I'm sure she will tell us later whether she still acts or uh, or not, but she is a hypnotherapist. And after the break, we will get to talk to her about her life's work, her acting, and her book. And her book is called The Limitless Soul. And we'll be talking about past life regression, hypnotherapy, uh, spiritual regression, etc. So get those questions ready to happen. Um, before I tell you a bit more about Bryn David, so oh, so people sent in their own money, or they were given money from the study. David, they were given money from the study. So the study was funded, and they allocated a nominal amount, $5, to people in need in that disaster and in that time and said, here's $5. You can use it to help your situation or you can use it to pay someone for thoughts and prayers. Fascinating concept, hey? So Bren is the author of The Limitless Soul, Hypnoregression Case Studies into Past, Present and Future Lives. She is the founder and executive director of the Braith Centre located in North Carolina. She is a certified master hypnotherapist, an instructor, an author, and an actress. Discovering the power of hypnosis and meditation while working as an actress in commercials and film at a professional level, Bren used hypnosis in a way of removing boundaries opening new doors in her career and for self-healing. She found it was a wonderful tool for calming the mind, relaxing the body and freeing the instrument, allowing the character to emerge. And I'm sure she's referring to her acting roles in that instance. Bren changed her careers to become a hypnotherapist out of a strong desire to help others through their own transitions and healing. And that's what brings us her to our show today is her work around hypnotherapy and healing. She found it was rewarding and went on be to become a hypnosis instructor, helping students to hone their hypnosis skills. Bren has taught internationally and her certification course uh, courses across the U.S. draw international students to them. And so her book is about numerous past life, afterlife and future life case studies. The Limitless Soul invites you to explore the many aspects of the soul's existence. These narratives show that life is not a random series of events. They can be used to gain insight into your soul's future while exploring earthly lessons for your current incarnation. Using her hypnoregression technique, soul expression spiritual regression author Bryn explains how revisiting certain times in your soul's history can bring resolution to long-standing issues and shift energies that are affecting your current life. This enlightening book carries universal messages and offers hands-on exercises, meditations and practices for awakening your soul's guidance. With it, you'll discover your personal gifts and a deeper understanding of your place in the world. So we're going to pop on to a break, and when we return, I'll introduce Bren to you, the listeners. Over to you, Rebel. And welcome back, everyone, to Radio Tony. I'm your host, Tony Lontis, and today's guest is the wonderfully amazing Bren Blankenship. How are you, Bren? I'm great, Tony. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I am delighted to have you, and I'm sure our listeners have lots of questions saved up for you. But before we get on to the questions, 
uh, just a little introduction. You're in North Carolina and you have your own business uh, around hypnotherapy. Is that correct? Yes. I'm a hypnotherapist and yes. I do transpersonal hypnotherapy. I work with current life issues as well as past life regression and the spiritual world in between um, for resolving issues and working through themes that someone's working on through their various incarnations. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait to get into the subject today. <laughs> but before we do, in another life, you are an actress. Yes. And so, well, where I was going to say in this life and in a past life. Oh, really? Yes. That's fascinating to know. And did you know that from did you know that from a young age that you wanted to be an actress or was it just something that you were drawn to? Well, it was something that I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to get started. Yeah. And I was on, um, you know, as a kid, I was on a couple of shows in our local area, um, you know, growing up in the U.S. And then it's just something that I put aside, but I always wanted to do it. But I started out on the traditional route, um, yes. you know, traditional job and um, working as a legal assistant. And okay. it was fun and it was interesting, but I didn't see myself doing that the rest of my life. Yes. And I started studying acting, started studying on the side. Uh -huh. And a group of us even hired a coach from L.A. and flew him out to North Carolina. And we would work with him. And then I started auditioning, traveling all over, you know, wherever my agent had an audition for me, I would go yeah. and do that. So, you know, that's how I got started. But um, hypnosis came in a little later on. Okay. So let's get into that. What happened in your life that drew you to hypnotherapy? Well, what was happening is... Um, <laughs> in addition to being an actress, I had stage fright, which is a common wow. thing for actors. And, you know, but I didn't know that as much back then. Um, and I sought out the services of a hypnotherapist to help me clear stage fright. Yeah. And I went into, um, that's when I went into a past life regression and understood more about that because there was a time in the past, in a past life, where I had to sing for my supper. And as an uh -huh. artist where I was a starving artist on the streets. And yeah. then another time where I was an opera singer and very well off. So I experienced all sides of, um, you know, the showbiz world. And this was back in the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s. Yeah. So yeah. I experienced that side of it. And doing that session helped to clear some things. So I did a series of past life sessions and other actors that I knew, they were working full time. And I had left the legal firm, but I was still working a day job. And I wanted to be able to support myself fully as an actress. And I was willing to travel. Like I said, you know, I'll go to New York. Sometimes I would go to Florida. I would yeah. go wherever I needed to go. And there's actually a film studio here, a couple of them here in North Carolina. Okay. So um, I would I went to the regressionist and expected to have a past life session to clear whatever blocks were holding me back. Yeah. And I popped into a future um, a future time in my current life, a precognitive right. session. So in that did, scene, sorry, I am standing. Did, no, did did that was. Uh, was that overwhelming for you to see something that hadn't happened yet? No. You know what? It was exciting because, okay. because I didn't, you know, as it was unfolding, I didn't know what this was yet. I'm in right. a scene. I knew it wasn't a past life. And then I started to understand that I was connecting with spirit guides and with guidance. So that, uh -huh. that part was exciting. And so as it unfolded, I was standing in prairie grass, and there was an orchard of apple trees in front of me, yes. and I was walking through the orchard having my pick. I was literally picking apples off the trees, having my pick, 
And it was so, it just felt so wonderful. And um, I was told you're going to go out there for one thing and come back with another. Right. So all this time, I'm thinking I'm going to be moving to New York. I've been looking uh-huh. at, um, you know, looking at permanent residence up there. And my husband, he was going to stay back in North Carolina. Um, so, that, you know, but at the same time, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I was looking in that direction. Yes. So after that session, um, out of the blue, a friend of mine who had moved to L.A. five years before called me up and she said, Bren, you need to come out here. You would do great out here. Right. And she said, you can even stay with me for a couple of weeks. So mm-hmm. I had everything worked out to go. And I was all set and fear set in. I mean, yeah. I was literally days away from leaving. I was packed. And I had the kind of fear that paralyzes your feet to the ground. Yeah. yeah. And so I told my husband, I said, I'm, I'm not going to go. I'm just, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, at that point he sat me down and he said, look, I'm going to talk to you. You need to do this. You've put the work in. I mean, I've been studying for years at that point. You've done the work. It's all lined up. Just go and see what happens. You don't have to know what the outcome is. Just go do it. Yeah. He said, and if I need to come out, I will. And, you know, just so, So I sat with, and then he left and I sat with myself and had a conversation, picked myself up and got in the car and drove out there. Right. And after I got there, I joined an acting class. Someone saw me, told their agent, and she signed me on the spot. And then my job was to audition. Yes. Like everything was lining up, all the work that I put in. Yes. And so my job was to audition. And so I would audition three or four times a day, five days a week. That was incredible. Because here, you know, on the East Coast, you're auditioning a couple of times a month, and you're happy to have that. And, you know, so my job was to audition. And then I started booking work. And um, I I had many great opportunities out there. And things were were going along. And then after I'd been there for a while, um, I booked a commercial in the grapevine, which is north of L.A. Yes. And I was on location, and I had my Birkenstock sandals, and I'm standing there, and I've got this trailer with my dressing room and my star on the door. It felt, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Yeah. And looking out over the hillside at these trees, and we were filming under one of the trees. Yes. And so um, I'd already done my segment for the day and I was waiting for later when I would have to do something. And someone said to me, hey, you need to watch out. Um, There could be snakes in that grass. And I looked down at my feet and looked up and had like one of those deja vu moments back into the session. I'm standing in the scene that I had seen in the session about a year before, but I'm in it now. I'm living it. And the only yes, difference yes. was there were not apples on those trees. It right. looked exactly like the scene. There just weren't literal apples on the trees. And so I knew what all of this meant. And um, so I stayed out there a couple of years. And yes. my husband would fly out and I would fly home back and forth. But while I was there, I started studying um, hypnosis and getting into regression. And then I decided I would come home and then go to where the people were that I wanted to study with. Yes. So that's how it shifted for me. Uh-huh. And I also got to the point where there wasn't a problem. I didn't freeze up like I used to. Yes. Um, you know, it's just I would go and do my thing. Because yes. when you're an actor, if you're thinking, then you're, you're out of the moment. You yes. just need to be doing it. You you rehearse it, and then you let it fly. You let it flow through you. And that's what I mean by freeing the instrument. And so if yes. your instrument is stuck in your head or out of tune, you know, you're not going to, the scene or the character is not going to flow through you the way that it could. And yeah. so this was so much fun, all the work behind the scenes, as well yeah. as, you know, that experience. So, Bryn, I want to backtrack a little bit because there are those out there who would suggest that they don't believe in past lives, reincarnation, hypnotherapy. What 
is your answer to that? That's perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> so if that's their belief, that's fine. However, I have a lot of people that have come in and they weren't sure they believed in past lives. They just wanted yeah. to explore and they were surprised to find out that they had had not one, but several, many, multiple past lives and to find out more details about that. And, um, and to get some confirmation about why they're interested in some of the things that they're interested in now yes. or why they're repelled by certain things or drawn to others. You know, I had a lady this afternoon who had a fear of water um, yes. and she knew that that was significant. And we explored in past lives to understand more about that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, and resolve so that issue. A lot of people would have experienced that deja vu feeling. Can you describe for our listeners, what is deja vu? Well, it's that feeling that you've been here before, um, that you're recognizing something about a place or a person or a situation that seems familiar, but it's not that you've been here in your current life. Yeah. So if you took a trip to another country yes. and you went to a site or, you know, a, a certain, let's say there's an old tavern that's been there for a, hundred, a couple hundred years. Yes. And you walked into that tavern and it seemed familiar. Yes. I know of another person who went to a town and um, the bakery seemed very familiar. And in a past life, we discovered that she was blind in the past life, but she, she knew how many steps it was from where she lived to all the places around town in yes. that village. And she could recognize things through her other senses more so than just sight because in that past life, she didn't um, have the gift of sight. And in her current life, when she went there, everything just, it was so familiar. She knew how to get around. She didn't have to look at a map. She just knew. Yeah. I know from my own experience that um, last year, almost this time last year, um, I, my husband and I went to Edinburgh in Scotland for the first time ever. I've never been to Scotland before. But I remember distinctly the plane gliding into Edinburgh Airport and it felt like I was coming home. And I've never been to Edinburgh before, never been to Scotland before. And over the course of the next two weeks, through our trip across Scotland, there were many places that I just felt like home. And that's deja vu, isn't it? That's a, that's a memory that's carried in our soul uh, from yes. another time and place. That's a soul memory, and you're, yeah. it's being reignited by being in that situation, um, in those places. And Scotland is just beautiful. I've I've had some of those remembrances as well, yes. um, traveling along Scotland and through the countryside. It, it's a and in Australia. Beautiful. I've been to Australia. I've taught over there yes. a couple of times, yes. and had some really wonderful memories come up um, from past lives over there as well. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. So, um, and just for our listeners, just a little uh, Australia in terms of uh, Western world history is a very young country. Our history is only 200 years old, whereas other nations across the world have centuries of human uh, experience across their lands. And... Um, it, I'm sure that for a lot of Australians, it's uh, they will experience those deja vu moments when they visit other countries across the world. Um, Bryn, Zara wants to know, how does this work and will it work for everyone? So, Zara, just to clarify, are we talking about hypnotherapy or are we talking about deja vu? Um, Bryn, while we wait for Zara to get back to us, what's the difference between deja vu and regression therapy? Well, so deja vu is more like a spontaneous memory that something just yes. pops in. Where yeah. 
uh, re regression therapy. And, and there's a couple of different kinds of regression therapy. You know, there's current life regression. So you yeah. can take someone through their current life and pull up memories to clear something that is holding them back. You know, yeah. um, it's something from, that they are aware has happened in their current life. And, um, you know, like if it's fear of public speaking, it could be from childhood, having to stand up in front of the class and deliver book reports. And that's when the fear kicked in and then it got reinforced each time you were forced to do that. Yeah. So um, that's current life regression. And, and then there may there's, be no... There may be no rationale or reason around that fear um, and it may just pop up in your everyday life and there may, there doesn't have to be a reason for it, does there, Bryn? Right. And so a lot of things I like to address for towards current life unless there's no reason for it. So if there's no reason for it, often yeah. we'll go into past life. Um, yes. And explore where that, you know, we could just go back and explore where it came up and then find out more details around it. So um, let's say a fear of heights. A yes. fear of heights could come from um, any number of things. However, if it's a really strong, we're talking more than just a little n nudge or, yes. you know, it was some, a really strong fear. Um, that could be from a past life. And when you explore it, you know, oftentimes it's, someone that was forced over the edge of a cliff in a past life. And so they yes. carry that fear with them yes. or um, um, a fear of cats. You yes. know, a fear of cats can be that you were killed by a tiger in a past life. Um, oh, wow. Yes. Or an allergy, allergic to cats. It could be something yes. like that. Um I'm trying to think of some of the other situations. Um, I mean, there are just so many. And there's yeah. not one reason. Fear of public speaking, fear of heights, um, fear of car accidents, fear of the water, all of those yes. things. Are, are you know, pretty I've had people with fear of water that drowned in an ocean and others who, were, who drowned in a well, whether oh. by accident falling in a well in a past life or yeah. being forced into a well. So and obviously... And obviously that hasn't happened now in where they're in their current life, obviously. Exactly. Because yeah. they're in the chair talking to me. <laughs> yeah, that's so, right. So they're still yeah. alive to talk about it, right? That's right. But in they the past just... sessions, we go through the lifetime and explore that. And we go through the death scene and take them into the spirit world where they meet with their spiritual guides those, those helpers that help us here while we're on earth, while we're incarnate. And they help us to understand on a deeper level what that's about and help yeah. us to resolve that so that those fears are neutralized because you've got the lesson from it. Yes. See, the trauma gets stuck there. The distress gets stuck there because in the situation, it doesn't have an outlet, so it's held in. Yeah. So if someone, um, I had someone who had just a fear they were afraid and they didn't know why they were always afraid yeah. and going into a past life. What had happened was, um, I don't remember what year it was, but I think it was around the, the 1800s, early 1800s. Yeah. And someone was coming to their house and their mother said, I want you to go hide and don't come out until I tell you. And oh. her mother was very stern and, you know, she knew her mother was scared for her yes. safety yes. And so this little girl went and hid, like she was told to do. And yeah. her mother never never came back for her. Oh. So this little girl was scared and hiding, and, and that stayed. fear yeah. never had an outlet. Yeah. So that fear stayed stuck in there. And so when we readdressed this during the regression, we were able, with the help of the guides in that spiritual state, to pull that distress out, to help her to see beyond that situation and to help her to see that, you know, she's okay now. Every, you know, she got past that. Yeah. And she went yeah. on to have a life in that past life. But, you know, she never fully felt herself. Right. Right. She wasn't a happy child. You know, she lost her mom and she didn't know where her mom went. Yes. So yes. that could also carry forward fear of abandonment and loss. And so in those sessions, we can neutralize that. 
um, and help the client to just experience a more fuller expression of who they are now and be happier and yeah. more at peace with themselves. Yeah. Bryn, Mike wants to know, does everyone have a past life? That's a great question, Mike, by the way. That is a great question. And there are some new souls who have not, who really don't have past lives. Yes. But I'll have to say I haven't worked with any of them. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I guess they're not coming in for those kinds of sessions. They're out experiencing the world and kind of getting their bearings. Yes. Um, I think, you know, you, you've been here a few times before you start coming in, assessing at a deeper level. The yes. first few times, I think you're kind of learning the planet and survival and, you know, Living trying out the different things. Experience. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So there you go, Mike. Lots of people do have past lives, but there may be some who don't, and that's okay too. So, Bryn, I want to know um, a bit more about the teachers you had on your path to being um, a, a hypnotherapist. Yes. Well, um, so I studied with Roger Wolger. Mm -hmm. who he's known for, he's a British um, Jungian therapist, and he's known for his ancestral work, where yeah. the subtle energy bodies carry stored memory patterns, and you can transform that to um, find relief to longstanding issues. And yeah. so what that means is you can, your sense memory in the energy or in your personal energy space carries a memory. And yes. you can tap into that memory and find out more. And then if it's something that's holding you back, you can resolve that. So yes. I was working with Roger Wolger, and then I learned about Michael Newton. Yes. And Michael Newton, he wrote Journey of Souls, Destiny of Souls. And he was yes. a pioneer in the field of regression, specifically life between lives, regression, spiritual regression. Mm -hmm. And um, he taught us about insight into pre-birth planning prior to incarnating. Yes. So his work talks about how we plan out a life, we come down here, and we live the life that we've planned out. And if we have free will in there as well. Yes. But he was able to guide people to the between and find out more about how things in the spirit world work and find out yes. more about the structure there. Yes. And so I worked with Michael Newton. And then um, I also worked, uh, studied with Brian Weiss, uh, Many Lives, Many Masters. And, of course, yes. he's well known yes. for past life therapeutic work. Yeah. And then with Roger, uh, with Michael Newton, um, I went on to, that's when I left. I was on a study track with Roger yes. uh, Roger Wolger. And then I moved into um, alignment with Michael Newton, helped him start the Newton Institute. Yes, um, yes. I, I'm a lead instructor for the Newton Institute, as well as serving on the board for seven, seven and a half years. Yeah. Um, and that was just such an incredible time, and it was so exciting to be able to work with him. And um, and then my work started changing. My sessions yes, yes. started changing and evolved. And they would go into the spirit world, but they didn't follow the format that Michael Newton taught. And they sort of... Um, they're, you know, they're, they're working in another part of the spirit world, and certainly if somebody has questions that they want ask, answered in that session, yes, we can yes. do that from the space over here, but it's more of a healing space. It's yes, more yes. of a, a way, um, this is, if it's okay, I'll, I'll tell you about Sessor. Um, yes, Sessor is soul expression, spiritual regression, and that's what I've called my, my work um, as it's evolved into this. And yes, it's yes. spiritual regression that is a magnification of one's soul for greater alignment. So yes, in that yes. session, you're bringing in more of your soul self into your current body to find and follow that soul's guidance so that you have a direct connection to your soul and to the messages and the guidance that's there, as well as your spiritual guides. And um, also in this session, is a it's a current life assessment. Yes. So SESSOR is the acronym for assessment. 
It's yeah. a, an assessment at this current stage of your life to find out more about why you're here, find and follow that soul's guidance, and identify negative patterns so that you can move through your issues more quickly with direct access to yourself. And so the reason that someone would do that is to not only work through their issue, but to have less worry and more trust in the divine plan because you understand your place in it. You understand it, more about why you're here. And it's, it's and put simply, it's about living your best life, the life that you're meant to live. Exactly. And so people will ask, what's the most important life? Well, of course, it's the one that you're in now. Yeah. So we're using these tools, the tool of soul expression, spiritual regression, or past life regression as tools to help you now in the space that you're in now to understand more of who you are, move through things that are holding you back or restricting you, and to really uncover the mysteries of your soul's incarnations. Because you can also tap into a past life and bring forth knowledge you know, I've worked with people to tap into past lives. You know, one one person um, had a um, a foreign exchange student from yeah. um, Spain, and he wanted to brush up on his Spanish. So he asked if he could go into a past life session in in a Spanish speaking country where he felt like he probably had one, and um, bring back Spanish. So we did that, and it was quite amazing. Wow. Um, you know, he, he, he really did um, improve his Spanish and he could communicate with this foreign exchange student um, while they were living there. So in their in his house. So, you know, you just you can bring back all kinds of skills as you are in touch with those lifetimes that you've, you know, um, developed that skill. Bryn, is there any way of knowing how many past lives you have? You know, you can ask in session, but yeah. I will I will say it's hard to really know because some clients get numbers, all kinds yes. of numbers. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes the guides will give answers like more than can be counted. Yes. More times than um than can a number can be put to. So yes. they, I've I've been told because I've asked, you know, in the session, I've asked various guides why they do that. And they said, because we don't want the client to lose focus about yes. what's most important. Yes. The message coming through is more important than them focusing on how many times they've had a lifetime yeah. or how many times they've been working on a particular issue. Although yeah. there are, are many times that they will tell you how many times you've been working on a particular issue. Oh, that, that okay. we tend to get numbers or or um, answers. You know, you've had several lifetimes where you've been the victim. Now there are other lifetimes where you've been the perpetrator. And now it's time to neutralize wow. that and move on from this. Yeah. So they may give a number in that situation. Is it traumatic for people to discover that they've been the perpetrator of a crime of some sort? Yes, most yeah. people. It's very difficult to to admit or accept that you did something bad. Yeah. But you know, there's the guides know this and will work with you. You know, they they give you the information. Um, they share with you about that life, and then they help you to see the growth that you've had because of the situation, okay. um, because of what you've done, or yes. because of being the victim. And yeah. on that side of it. So um, there's a lot of growth and it, it, it's an opportunity. Let's say it's an opportunity for growth. And some yeah. souls don't take the opportunity, but many do. Yeah. And also there's learning for everyone that's involved. There's learning for all the players in that scenario or in that lifetime. There's a lot of learning by yeah. um the per, you know, by being involved in the situation as the person yes. perpetrating the crime yes. or as the victim or as yeah. a family member. Yeah. 
Bryn, we're going to have to go for a little break, but when we come back, I'd like to explore the structure of the spirit world as well as continue our wonderful discussion on soul expression, spiritual regression. So over to you, Rebel, and when we come back, we'll be talking more with Bryn. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Tony Lontis on Radio Tony, your safe space today. And we've been talking to the wonderful Bren Blankenship about past lives, uh, hypnotherapy and spiritual regression. And before the break, I thought that we'd talk just briefly, if we could, Bryn, about the structure of the spiritual world. Sure. So there's a great deal of structure that goes on in the spirit world to get us here. Mm -hmm. And. What I like to focus on there is, and, and we're working at the soul level of the mind when we're speaking of the spirit world, we're working yes. at that dimension. And you have a soul advisory council. They help us to um, plan the life that we're coming to experience. They help us with the bigger picture and pre-birth mm -hmm. planning. And then we have guides or teachers um, and you have more than one guide, um, but you'll have your primary guide that helps you with things. And the guides help us with details, the day-to-day. Yes. -day. They are more like uh, translators. They are in touch with us, and they ha each have specialties that they assist us with as we're going along. So uh -huh. when I was acting, I had acting guides. And then as I got, became involved with um, regression and um, Sessor and all of that, my guides evolved with that to those specialties. And, um, and so when you're coming to be born, you, you have that pre-birth planning where you plan out the lifetime, you plan out the tools and the skills that you'll bring with you. Yeah. And I, I have a case study in my book um, that talks about this, the birthday suit, the, the, the gifts that you bring with you. Yes. And she talks about the birthday suit, where it's this translucent suit that is sewn into the body on um, all the things that we need to bring with us and the people that we'll meet along the way yeah. so that we'll have that recognition that wakes us up. You know, we were talking about deja vu, that moment where it just wakes you up to an awareness there's something special about that person or yes. I need to go talk to that person or as yes. you're talking to them, you know, you know that there's something about them that um, you're to do together. And then yes. that evolves into a friendship or a business relationship or, you know, wherever that takes you. And so you, um, your, your soul advisory team, your soul advisory council is helping with that. And um, in the pre-birth part, and, and they're still there and available to us. However, it's mm -hmm. the guides that tend to work with the details along the way. Yeah. And then as you're planning out your life, um, as you're living your life that you've come in to experience, you know, Earth is known as the emotional planet. So yes. half the battle of being here is just managing your emotions with all yes. the things that happen to us. And so um, as you're doing that, if you were to make a, a free will choice that veers you off of the, the intended life, so to speak, you yeah. have options yeah. that opportunities that you may take along the way. And um, sometimes that opportunity may seem like you're taking the long way but you're actually taking the short way in the long run because yes. for a lifetime, it might seem like you're taking the wrong, the long way, however, a long way to get to your goal. However, mm -hmm. in the scheme of all of your lifetimes, you know, with, in the bigger picture, you're yes. actually jumping ahead of things to get there more quickly by taking that, um, um, that, that riskier path. So, um, the guides help us with that if we change direction or if someone that we were supposed to line up with, if they change direction. Your guides mm -hmm. work with you along those routes to get you where you need to be for what you're here to do, to, mm -hmm. to stay in touch. And so in that, um, you know, your role in this, be, so, so your soul is in the spiritual realm and a yes. piece of yes. it comes here 
into this yes. physical body. And yes. then your role is to stay in touch with your soul's guidance. Yes. You know, and ask that was for my next guidance. question. Yes. Yes. We're How part do of we know. Well, you you know when you get that hit, that little nudge, or or something lights up when you you know that you made the right choice and you know yes. you went in the right direction. Yes. That's them. Or there are those times where um, your GPS system in your car may tell you to go this route, yes. and something makes you go a different route. Yep. And you end up running into someone that you haven't seen in a long time that's just the perfect person for you to run into that day. Yes. That's that guidance that's taking you where you need to be, even though GPS is saying go this way. You know, yes. and and what this is doing, it's improving the relationship with ourselves through our various soul incarnations on Earth and on other planets. This is about improving your relationship with yourself and knowing that. You are loved, you're not alone, and you're here on purpose. So in doing yes. that and understanding your place in the bigger picture, your role in being here, you yeah. can take more responsibility for your life and know that you're not here by accident and that yeah. all lives are part of that divine plan, the perceived good and the perceived bad. Yeah. And also that no life is wasted. Yeah. So we have all these helpers that are there that are helping us. And, you know, some people may never come in for a session. Yes. They're lined up. They know what they need to do. And they're out doing it. Yes. And then there are others that get that guidance that, you know, I just feel like there's more than what I'm doing. To, there's mm -hmm. more out there, there. There's more to life. But I don't know what that is. Yes. Um, those are the people that come in or people that already doing it but want more information they've already taken that leap and have taken the risk to step out into their authentic self and do what they were meant to be doing and they yeah. just want more information and more guidance along the way yeah yeah so you're co-creating with your soul's guidance yeah and you're learning to listen to those little nudges and to be more present living more in the present moment so that you're not worrying, you're not fearful. I mean, that's a human emotion and we all can go there, but it's not. It's about not staying in that space. It's about staying in a place of co-creating and joy and happiness so that you can create more joy and happiness instead of the things that you don't want. Yeah. yeah. Brent, do you find that um, for some people, it's harder than for others to tap into those guides or or listen to that intuition inside your mind? Yes. Mm -hmm. See, the way in is through the heart and not the head. Yeah. And, um, you know, there are other styles of hypnosis. It's about retraining the mind. But this is at a deeper soul level. Yes. And for some people, it's about getting them out of their heads. Yes. And for others, it's just easier for them to get into that space, to connect to their guides. Yeah. But it can be done. And, um, you know, most people are able to come in and do this. By the time they're guided to come in for this kind of a session, they're able to tune in and achieve connection and guidance and get messages and images. Um, and... Um, for others, they may have to do it a second time. You yeah. know, I mean, if if the worst case scenario, you just have to do it again. But most yeah. people get there on that that first session, and it begins to open them up, and then they are, are starting to see more of themselves, and then they may come in for a second session. Now, for Cesar, you need to have had a past life session first. So that okay. past life session is is a certain. It is designed a certain way to line you up for the next level, which would be the Cessor session. And your guides and your team know that that's the plan. So yes, yes. they are aligning you at the right time in your life to come in to have that kind of a session and then prepare you for the, the deeper session of Cessor, which um, spends more time in the spiritual realm. It, yes. it doesn't explore a past life. It doesn't go that route. Um, but the past life is like paving the way to to pull up those kinds of memories 
before we take you into the deeper session of Sessor. Okay. Brent, do people have to be physically with you to do this type of therapy? Is it something that you can do over modern technology, say Skype or Zoom, or do you physically have to be in the room with you to do it well or properly? I, I do it with them physically in the room okay. because there's something that there's an energy bubble that we create working with that client. And there are too many things that happen with technology when you're doing these kinds of sessions, yeah. these energy sessions that, um, you know, I need to be able to connect to them um, yeah. and they're not going to be able to get up and fix the computer if their connection goes out. Yeah. Um, and also I just prefer to be the physical, um, physically there. Yes. Yeah. So can you tell our listeners what a, um, what a session with you looks like and, and, and what happens, what, what they need to do to prepare? Well, I put some exercises in my book to help yes. people to open up, you know, and, um, people are at various levels of awareness. So those various meditations and, and journal exercises are to get people back in tune with themselves and to, to learn how to listen to that guidance, to understand what that guidance feels like yes. um, in little ways so that when we come in for the session and guides are able to start talking and, com well, communicating telepathically with them they're able to understand clearly and and start to discern so um one, one thing that listeners can do yes. it's the tree meditation it's one of my favorites yeah. and um it's it's in the story in my book about the monk taking the path of contemplation yes. and the monk is um, he's this client came in and he's in a lifetime where he goes back to a time where he became a monk after his um, younger brother was killed in a horse accident and his parents were killed by the plague, but they had never uh -huh. gotten over the death of their son. Mm -hmm. So he's a young man, teenager, and alone. And he joins the monastery, but he's a very angry monk. <sighs> So, yes. And so he decides to sit down under this tree and contemplate the situation that caused him to lose his family. And he's angry at God. Yes. So over the course of time, he ends up, his useful purpose is break, baking yeasty bread for the monastery. That's his uh -huh. useful purpose. And going into town to get supplies, he passes that tree. So oh. over the course of time, he moves out of anger and finds it to be a peaceful place where he can sit and communicate and remember his mother making jam for him and his oh. favorite foods and his brother, you know, who he was very close with. And that um, led me to include a meditation called the tree meditation where you yeah. sit under a tree and connect with the tree's energy. And it brings yeah. you out of the external stimulation and brings you more inward to yourself. And as you do that, you can start to listen to that inner guidance. You can start to connect to the tree, let the branches of the tree carry that, uh, you know, carry your burdens away up into the light. Let yourself be grounded um, like the roots of a tree are grounded. Yeah. So that's one way. I mean, there's so many different ways, but it's about getting clear, getting quiet and still inside so that you can hear. Yes. And if you can do that, then that's a good preparation prior to coming in for a session. Okay. And then we'll take it further um, into that um, and, and find out much, much more. And what we're doing is um, awakening you to the truth that you already knew about yourself. Yes, yes. You know, you know this deep inside, and I'm helping to facilitate you connecting in a way that you can bring this out and experience more of a magnification of your soul, greater yeah. alignment with your soul in making your choices and moving through your life with more joy and happiness and lightness. Yeah. Lightness brings joy. Joy brings lightness instead of being weighed down with the burdens of life. Yes. 
life is meant to be a joyful experience for most yes. of the time. Yes. And it's understandable why we get caught up in these other things, but we don't want to stay stuck there. We want to move through it. We want to move past it to be that brilliant being that we are, that yeah. lightness. We are we are co-creating because our soul is able to create. Our soul creates it. It's creating the life that we're here to live. And so, um, so effectively, we just have to listen to what our soul is telling us. And yes, we will be happier, more fulfilled, be living a life that we're meant to be living. And you'll have less, less worry. You'll have more trust. You know, yeah. you'll have more faith in knowing that things will work out as part of the divine plan. Yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering what other kinds of things did the people that you've worked with in your book experience, Bryn? Well, um, I had um, I had one lady, you know, we're talking about joy, but yes. she lived, uh, she was a Civil War widow in yes. Virginia in the United States during the Civil War and there was a life of loss and grief and it had carried over and she was having physical illness now and she learned to transform that she learned to let go of um, that grief because she was grief stricken with yes. the weight of loss and then everywhere she looked in that life you know whole the whole countryside was torn apart and ripped apart by war. and everyone was lost you know, experiencing loss and it, it, you know it was just a grim time in our american history and um she was able to work through that and what's interesting is in that past life she was very straight laced straight laced and um i would say pent up yeah. And in current life, she's very laid back and she understood more about why she chose to be more laid back. She remembers making that decision earlier in her life about I'm not going to live a straight laced life. Yeah. And she got um, reprimanded a lot, judged a lot by others because they would tell her how she had to be. And yes. now she understands why um, she chose not to be that way and she's she's been able to move through a lot of challenges in her life because of it yeah and then um there's another woman who came in she had um <laughs> she had mm -hmm. what i call spiritual performance anxiety oh and, wow <laughs> yes it's like you know wanting to do a good job but being impatient wanting to hurry up and get home yeah. and her guides came in and said look you came down there to live a life. You need to just relax and live your life, and you will get here soon enough. Um, and she also had some insecurities about her husband and went back into a lifetime that explained where that was coming from and how um, they had things had come between them in a past yeah. life. Mm -hmm. That were not coming between them now. So she was, her her worries were unfounded. Yes. It's just that she was carrying that forward and it was creating issues now because it just, it, it caused her insecurity and fear of, she also had a fear of success. Uh -huh. And we covered a couple of lifetimes in her session where she was a king and out in front of everyone in that life. And, um, left the kingdom oh. for a life of solitude at the end of that life. And the guides were saying, you did a great job because you could have been caught up in the kingdom and leadership, but you let go of leadership and you lived the last, you know, the last maybe 10 years of your life in yeah. solitude in the woods. And so you did a great thing by doing that because you allowed others, your successors to move forward. And you, so she, they were teaching her to connect that way, to find that quiet time and not be so, such in a hurry to get home. Home uh -huh. meaning the spirit world. Wow. 
I've got some wonderful comments from our listeners and I just want to read them out. So Steph says, okay. I like hearing the stories of the show. This is fun. Leo says, just when we were getting deep into this, a break. I can't wait to come back. And <laughs> Ivy says, this is a really good show. I'm really listening in. And Willow wants to know, how can we listen the way we need to? Bryn, I'm going to let you answer this again. <laughs> okay. So... When you're listening from that deeper place, it comes from your heart. So find a quiet space, not while you're driving, not where others are around, but just a quiet space. Put your hand over your heart, sit quietly, and tune your your attention inward, and just be. And if you have distracting thoughts, push them away. Don't pretend they're not there acknowledge them and let them go, right? And then return your your breathing, your thinking, your awareness back to your center. And the more you can do that, the clearer things will start to get. And then you can start to ask questions. You, If you have a question that's on your mind, you can start to tune into that space and then you'll start to hear answers, you start to recognize the difference between your conscious mind telling you what the answer is and that deeper part of you sharing from a soul space what the answer is. And it takes practice. It takes time. It doesn't happen all at once. But over time, you can develop that and make that stronger and, and tune in. Um, you know, because I know that not everyone's going to be able to to come in for a session. So I added those things to the book to make um, to, to to make it available to readers a way to get the process started. Yes, it's about but, tuning out the outside external world and really listening from your core. And and the external world are the things like I need to get the washing done. Uh, yes. I need to pick the children up from school. I have to get to work on time. They're conscious, worldly thoughts. And those heartfelt, spiritual thoughts are completely different from that, aren't they, Bryn? Yes. And you do have to get all of those things done. But if you can take a few minutes to tune in, then you'll be able to get those things done with more energy and vitality. You'll just feel lighter and better. It might even give you some guidance as to a better way to get those things done, a better way to get everything done that you have to get done in your life so that you're not so wiped out at the end of the day from being pulled in so many different directions. And that soul guidance is there. All of us have it. Uh, That was my next question. Do all of us have soul guidance? And your answer is absolutely we all do. We just don't always listen. Yeah. Yeah. Leo wants to know, so where do we find the meanings if things are to teach us? Well, so in session, that's when after we explore the life, at the end of that life, we go to a place for soul reflection where the guides come in and we'll share more about the meaning of why that happened. And, you know, you you can start to look at things in your own life in a different way so that when something happens, um, you can start to look at why, you know, on a deeper level, why did that happen? If you can step back from it as the observer and observe it as two people, if there was an argument, two people going through something instead of looking at it as about me, sometimes you can see you know, some of the deeper meaning as well. But in these sessions, I'm not telling them. I'm helping to guide the client, but the client is guided into those spiritual realms, and then the guides come through and share the deeper meaning. You know, my client, often clients will beat themselves up. They'll feel like they were a failure or they messed up in that past life. And the guides will come in and say, no, it took courage to do what you did. It didn't work out the way you wanted, but the fact that you took a chance, you took charge of the situation instead of stepping back, you tried to help someone out. And yes, you were killed in that past life, 
but you try to help someone, now maybe you can try to help someone without getting hurt in the process. Yeah. You know, finding that balance. Yeah. So there's all kinds of messages that will come through from guides, but often we're beating ourselves up because we feel like we messed up or we failed. And they're saying, no, 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 you didn't fail. There's a lesson in there that you can carry forward now so that you don't get hurt this time. Yeah. There's a um, there's a story in the book called In Search of True Love. Yes. And yes. This, this story is about a woman who had a horrific past life with um, someone who was abusive and um, he cheated on her. He was physically yes. abusive and she pretty much just withered away and died. But he was abusive up until the end and he went to live with his other wife, with his mistress and his other family. And pretty much on the same property that she was living on back in plantation days. And, you know, it was such a horrific life. But her guides came in and helped to explain what that was about. Yeah. And then also explain that you were learning about love by not having love. You've learned about love through all of these lifetimes by having it, by not having it, by not appreciating what you had. Yeah. And now that you've learned, he said, your true love is coming. And um, this guide was explaining to her more about that. Yes. And, um, you know, we talked more about in the in the series. I did a series of sessions with her because yeah. her, her true love didn't show up when she thought he was going to show up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, the guide said he yeah, was coming. So she's like, it, why isn't he here? So <laughs> she um she she came back in a year later for the session and she and the guide said, He's still coming. You had a few more things to finish up, but a few more things to learn. That's right. And we learned even more about that life and a couple of other lifetimes. But they were explaining that you can learn about something by having it and also by not having it. Okay, so the the lesson might not be about the having of something. It might be learning through not having something. Is that what you're saying, yes. Brent? Yes, like, you know, that money. Yes. You can learn about money. Money is energy. It's not yes. to be held tightly. It's not to be squandered. However, you can learn about money by a lifetime of not having it. Yes. Or by a lifetime of having too much of it. Yes. And you can also have a, a lifetime of having a lot of money and do great things with it, but you can have a lifetime of having a lot of money and be restrained by it, you know, yes. the restrictions that come with it. So you can learn aspects of something through your various incarnations, and and then it, you, you, you get that lesson. And then you move on to the next piece of what your soul needs to experience. Yeah. Bryn, do you find that with your clients that some of us have to learn the same lesson or a similar lesson again and again and again? (laughs) It does seem like it. Um, Okay. Yes. And I laugh because the guides have a great sense of humor. Oh, I'm sure they do. (laughs) So when the client is meeting with the guides, sometimes they're like, how many times are you going to do this before you finally figure it out? And then when the client realizes they're teasing and the client lightens up, then they start to share with them more about that and what that's about. But yes, um, you know, you're working through a theme of, um, that may take a series of lifetimes to get through it. And okay. you're also often you're incarnating to help others. So there are yes. others in your soul group, your group of souls that incarnate with you that are maybe they're working on something. So this lifetime, it's more about their experience that you're here to help them and support them through. Right. And then another time it might be about you and what you need Yeah. And then they support you that way. Yeah. Okay. Renee has a question. How can we see the listeners, see the lessons rather? Another great question. And I'm going to let you answer that, Brent. (laughs) Well, 
I guess the best I'm way to describe that. Go I'm, ahead. I'm wondering if we can answer that wonderful question by describing for our listeners what a hypnotherapy session uh, uh, or a, a soul expression, spiritual regression session might feel like for the client? Can you sure. do that, Brent? Sure. So in that space, you know, I'm using words, music, breathing, all of these things that I'm using as tools to help the client guide themselves into that deeper state. Yes. And again, yes. it's getting out of the head and into the heart. It's out of the thinking mind and into the heart and that deeper part. And as you're doing that, you, um, you know, you explore that, that realm. You're met with love when you're greeted moving into the spiritual realms. There's great love and support from your loved ones, from your guides. And then you're taken, taken to these various places. Often you're taken to a space of healing. So, Um, you know, like, um, you might feel like a a shower of light showering over you. You might be taken to a chamber where, um, the, the distress from that life, from the past life, or even from current life is being lifted off of you. Some clients call it a medical, like a medical, um, a spiritual medical room that they're in where they're feeling energy moving through them. So they're using energy to lift this off of you, um, these things that have been weighing you down, and your guides know how to help you with that. And then there's great joy. Clients experience a great deal of joy in these sessions um, for a richer experience and connection to themselves. And it's very beautiful um, to see because there are tears of joy, there's happiness, when they realize they're loved. Yes. When you realize that you are loved so deeply by these wonderful, wise beings that have helped us plan out our life to get here, that are helping us, you know, to know that you're not alone and to help us under uncover those mysteries of our soul's incarnations. Yes. That is powerful stuff. It's powerful for me. I'm often in tears along with them. It's so beautiful I was just to be say, in the room. How, how, do, how do your clients' sessions impact on you as a healer? Oh, it's incredible because it just helps you have more compassion for people because you don't yeah. know what they're going through. When you run into someone on the street and they're having a bad day, you don't know what just happened to them. You don't know what they're dealing with in their personal life. It just helps you to see people in a whole nother light. And maybe you can do something like just smile or yes. do something kind, like open a door that just changes their day or changes one moment in their life. And maybe they go home to their children or they go back to the office and they're happier, nicer, yes. kinder yes. to those around them. You know, this is helping clients, you know, to um, have an awareness of themselves at a deeper level and their their attributes. If you yeah. look over your life, you know, I'd love I'd love to be able to have everyone sit in the chair in my office and help them to explore this. But if yes. for yeah. those that can't, take a look at your life. Look at themes. Just kind of reflect back, maybe journal a little bit, themes that you've worked through in your life up until this point. What are those common threads? What are the things that you're good at? What are the things that you've had to learn to improve on that you weren't so good at before, but maybe you're good, you're better at now? Yeah. You know, yeah. help to uncover those gifts that are yours that you bring with you. One of the clients that stands out in the book, she brings joy. Now, she's a happy person and didn't realize that bringing joy to a group of people just by being around them, what a gift that is. But when her guys explained it to her and how important it is at this time in history and why she's in the job that she's in and why that's so important, 
it shifted everything for her. And if she didn't need to go out and change jobs, it doesn't always mean that you have to give up everything that you've been doing and go do something different. And then other times it does. It, it's time for you to make a change. But sometimes it's about changing your perspective yeah. in the situation yeah. you're in so that you can bring more of the gifts that you're meant to share with others now. And so yeah. for her, it was joy and to lighten up, to stop being so difficult and hard on herself. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's about discovering things like uh, self-love and by discovering self-love, showing other people how to love themselves and be less hard on themselves. Yes. Something simple like that. Yes. Maybe what you're going through at this time in your life is going to teach you something that's going to help you help others. Exactly. Bren Zara wants to know, is it because something was set too peaceful and they feel better so I'm, I think Sarah's question perhaps is about the peaceful environment you create for people to do this work in but I I think that it's not just that I think it's the process of being calm and peaceful lets your mind um be lulled and allows your soul to speak to you. Is, is that a better idea, Bryn? Well, I think that's beautiful how you how you stated that. The exercises can help you to get into that peaceful space so that you can hear. But when we're doing the sessions in the office, um, they're very animated. You know, yeah. the clients are in the scene in the past life. You know, sometimes they're being chased. Sometimes they're. Um, you know, there are joyful times, there are sad times because they're re-experiencing some of the experiences in a past life or some of the lessons. Maybe they're in the spirit world, but they're being shown a scene or a series of scenes of things they've done. So it's not always peaceful. But, but it that, is safe. But you're working through those emotions and resolving them so that they're not holding you back now in negative thinking and negative patterns, yeah. if that makes sense. And the sessions are a safe place. So even if you are seeing yes. or experiencing something that is not great, like your own death, it's still a safe place for you to see and feel that, but you're not obviously physically going to die. That's right. correct, isn't it? Yeah. And moving through the death scene, most don't re-experience the death scene. They move okay. through it. And then they rise above. But I will okay. tell you, if you often, in the past life, the client will say, huh, he just stabbed me. I'm dying. <laughs> and they'll say it just like that. Okay. If you were being stabbed in your current life, you would not be saying it that way. And you would have a lot more emotion around it. But often, yeah. in the past life, it's like, oh, I just got shot. I'm dying now. Or... I've gone to sleep, I die in my sleep, and then I pass on. So they're not usually reliving. Once or twice they have, but generally they don't relive the death scene. There's no reason for that. It's no. to get you out of that lifetime into the between and then to meet with guides and review what was the purpose of that life? Why, why did my guides show me that life in today's session? Out of mm -hmm. all the lifetimes I've lived, why did they show me that one? Why is that relevant to me now and the challenges I'm facing in my current life? Yeah. yeah. Do your clients always uh, come up with the answers or the lessons um, or do they have to keep coming back a number of times to get the lesson or get the learning? The client always comes up with the answer. Okay. However, whether they take that and implement it when they go home uh -huh. of varying levels. You know, most people do. Most people take it and go with it. They're given guidance and they follow it. But there are some that don't. And, it, you know, they, they don't move out of their, their pattern the way they could. Uh -huh. They keep repeating that pattern until they finally break it. 
uh-huh. or or not. Some will continue that pattern, but but most do. Um, and so, you know, it's not for me to tell them what I think. Yes. It's for me to create that space, that neutral space, and give them a space to feel comfortable enough to explore their soul, to bear their soul. The clients in this, these books, the book and the other books that I'm in, yeah, these are actual client sessions where my clients have bared their soul yes. for the session and then given me permission to use that to, yeah. to help the reader because yes. there are many, many universal messages in these, in these stories. Yeah. And then my office as well is... Um, we've created a very special space here. The yeah. grounds here have wildlife and wetlands. I am here by the coast in North Carolina where the yes. hurricane came through uh, last week and last are you year. Okay? Um, we're fine. Um, a lot of people are still recovering from last year, but many and most, I would say most, are back in their homes, but there are still many that are not. Um, this one this year it it was a lot smoother um but thank you um but yes the you know that kind of energy clears the land and keeps the land fresh um keeps it charged up but um we're just we're just really used to her um, here (laughs) i have to agree with you bren because we suffered um in australia they're called cyclones and Mm -hmm. uh, one of the huge big cyclones was called debbie in 2017 and usually they stay up the northern coast of queensland they rarely come down towards us in the south however in 2017, Cyclone Debbie barreled, wiped out the top part of Queensland, wiped out the middle part of Queensland, kept going down into southern Queensland and northern New South Wales, and then popped across the ocean to and wiped out New Zealand. So she was a doozy. Um, and in the flooding aftermath of Cyclone Debbie, we spent the night on um, our dining room table with flood water raging around us, and we lost uh, we didn't we lost the inside of our home and 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 mostly everything that we owned. Wow. But the thing that came from that was that it wiped away a lot of rubbish from our lives. It caused us to simplify our lives. It yes. caused us to realize that we didn't need as as much stuff as we have. And it also, um, for us, we experienced true human kindness um, in the form of our community who brought us meals, flowers, replacement trees, called in on us, gave us money. And we would never, I would never have experienced that good side of humanity had we not had this catastrophic flood come through our property. Exactly. We experience the same kinds of things. Yes. Um, fortunately, I have not had that kind of loss to my home. I'm sorry that you went through that. But it does teach you to, to ha- you know, it teaches you what you need and what you don't need. So. Yes. It's a clearing that comes with it. Um, And, you know, we're on sandy ground here, so the waters recede quickly in many parts, but those along the river and some of the channels along there, they get flooded out, and it's much more difficult for them because homes get submerged underwater, cars are floating. Um, Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, our community... You know, if it didn't happen to you, you probably know someone it did happen to. And everyone steps out and helps each other because if you were lucky this time, you know, it could be you another time. Yeah. Yeah, that that's exactly right. In in talking about um, trauma and, and in particular the trauma that natural disasters bring, is hypnotherapy a good trauma healing tool? Yes. So if you had a past life where you died from a tsunami or a hurricane and flooding, um, then you could have a hypnosis session and clear that up. Now, you may not know that that's where it's coming from, but you might have a terrible fear, an irrational fear around 
drowning where you've yes. never even got allowed yourself to go out into the ocean or uh-huh. to the to the beach. And mm-hmm. that would you know, and there could have been another example of someone who maybe almost drowned and yes. then didn't, but it's triggering something in a past life as well. Um, so this can be used for current life if if you um, know that you've you know got an issue with something or around yeah. natural disasters or fear of that, or it could be used as a past life springboard to get into a past life where you're you know the the issue is rooted and where it originally began. Okay. Um, Steph's comment is, um, sorry, Ivy's comment first. Are we saying we need to really look at things and see the true value? Um, What was that again? So Ivy wants to know, are you saying we need to really look at things and see the true value? And I guess that is a follow-on question where we were talking about natural disasters and and finding the good that comes from that situation. I know for myself, I am the most positive person around. So I will take the positive from any negative situation, no matter what that is. And, and I see that as one of my gifts. Um, but others do not always see the good in the bad that happens to them, do they, Bryn? No, they don't. And, you know, some people experience some pretty horrific things. Yes. But in that, if you can find the silver lining or a message or something, maybe it can lift some of the burden of that experience. Um, it's like what you just said about, you know, everything that was happening to your physical possessions, but you were still safe. You know, you exactly. had to rebuild, you had to regroup and assess the situation, but it can also be an opportunity can be an opportunity to make some changes and to do some things differently exactly we so in the aftermath of that flood for us we were able to lift our house another 1.6 meters higher above the ground so (laughs) that's a good move (laughs) move. yeah so it would and and the positive of being that much higher in the air uh is we have a we had a beautiful view of our property to begin with, but we have a magnificent view now, and we can see higher up into the surrounding mountains. We get better summer breezes. Um, it, it, just lots of advantages to being up higher, and we never would have done that had we not experienced that catastrophic flood we would have just stayed you know and we were already um well above the ground to begin with but now we're really quite high above the ground and it's a a wonderful thing um steph's also got a question for us why does it take such a bad situation for people to bond together and be human well steph i really don't know why it takes bad situations for people to come together and help each other do you Bren um I think what it does is it awakens something in souls and especially souls I would say old souls the ones who've been here a few more times yeah that it it helps bond it helps you know it helps people rise above and bring out their best side it does and definitely some bring souls, out. It does bring out another side, but it's, you know, it, as a community, it brings out the goodness, the, the good in people, and an opportunity to help. Souls want to help. We want to help yes. each other. Yes. You yes. know, we want to be of use um, and help others with that. You know, when we were just speaking of... Um, learning lessons um i was thinking about relationships if you've yes, been yes. in a relationship and and the story in search of true love in the book if you've yeah. been in a series of relationships that you were not treated of value 
you're made to feel less than when you finally learn and recognize not to have not to move forward with people like that in your life moving you know as you're moving forward from those relationships then you're learning lessons you're learning from that to value yourself more yeah you're learning how to be treated how you allow yourself to be treated yeah. And um, so, you know, that's why someone may go through a series of relationships that are not so great. Yeah. But yeah. on a soul level, it's teaching them that you're worth more. You deserve yeah. better. Yeah. And how yes. to to have more of that in their lives. And it's important that everyone discovers that they are worthy of Uh, happiness and love every single human being across the planet is worthy of love belonging happiness and joy aren't they Bryn yes and that's what we mean by you are loved you are loved by these beings that have helped you to get here and it's learning to love yourself that self-love and self-value and self-worth and Some people seem to be born with it because that's the gift that they brought in with them. And others seem to be learning how to have it through their various relationships and not just romantic relationships, but friendships, business relationships, you know, um, where you learn to value yourself and step up and be the, the authentic person that you are. Yeah. And, and love yourself enough to say no. You know, saying no to someone is like saying yes to yourself. Yeah. And there are times that you have to say no. And there are times to say yes. And when you can learn the difference through your different experiences, then you'll know the kinds of people to allow in. And you'll know when to walk away and not even allow certain new people to come into your life. And it's about protecting your your soul because um, I know for myself that I only discovered self-love, self-compassion and self-empathy later in my life. And for the most part of my life, I spent my life pleasing other people, always saying yes and feeling guilty and terrible when I had to say no to someone. And again, it it took me a long time to learn that there is power in putting boundaries around the company you keep, the things that you'll do, and the amount of help that you give to other people. Because, listeners, you are just as important as any other human on this planet. And, Bryn, I know from your work that you would know that every individual human across the planet has a purpose, they are worthy of love, belonging and connectedness and until you learn that you are valuable as and uniquely you, you can't live with passion and you you, you can't live and lead the life that you're meant to lead. Yes, you're not, you're living a smaller version of yourself because you're not allowing your light to shine and you are here one purpose, not by accident. You are a part of the divine plan. All souls are part of that divine plan just by being here. Exactly. And so if, if you're listening today and, and you feel that your life is not where you want it to be, you can change that. And what you sh- Bryn You does, shift your thinking and yes. then it shifts your life. And it's a powerful thing to discover that and start walking in the life that you are meant to lead because things become easier. Your life flows better. You connect with beautiful souls. Just as I've been connected with Bren, uh, that the only reason we are connected is because I started on this journey of self-worthiness i wrote a book i got a radio show and now i get to talk to amazing people like bren and i get to tell me my wonderful listeners about 
all of the things that can help you in your human life. And I went on a journey and I went through some experiences and then I worked with others and then I wrote about it and then we connected all these many years later. Yes. Living, you know, each of us living our lives, not knowing each other. Yes. Until it was time to meet up. Yeah. And it's a powerful thing when that connection happens because it just is a beautiful thing. Brina, I've got, we're running out of time and I've realized that I've talked straight through two uh, segments and that's not a problem at all. But Aaron wants to know, how can that shift be made? Well, you first have to recognize that you're having negative thoughts, that you're having negative self-talk about yourself. And then you have to stop and reframe it. You have to stop and regroup. And it's it's hard at first. It is and then very it's hard. Easier. And then you start to recognize a couple of positives and then a couple of more. And then all of a sudden, you've just shifted out of that negative thinking. It just and takes one conversation a day. And Aaron, for me, um, I used to call myself an idiot. I'd kick my toe and say, oh, you idiot, or I'd drop something and say, oh, you idiot. So that was the first shift for me. I stopped calling myself an idiot. That's all it took. Exactly. That's all it took. Because if you do that, then you're telling others it's okay to call you that too. Yeah, and it's when not I okay. When I hear people call themselves an idiot, I say, stop, don't do that. And they yeah. look at me <laughs> and I say, yeah. no, don't ever don't do ever do that. Now, my wonderful listeners and my darling Bryn, we have less than one minute and my wonderful rebel in the background will be telling me time's up. So <laughs> before that time's up message comes up on my screen, one thing you'd like people to walk away from having read your book. And before I let you answer that, the contact details for Bryn are further up in the chat box where I put her uh, website um, and contact details. But over to you, Bryn, for the final say. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for having me on the show. This time has flown by and I love it. Um, I want the listeners to know that you are here by design, not by accident. You are loved. You have help available to you, and you're here on purpose for a purpose. Everyone, all souls are part of that divine plan. So as you read the book, I want you to look for those universal messages in the book. And there are many messages from my client sessions that are universal to all of the readers to help them see the bigger picture and maybe start to consider your own place in this world so that you can start to Learn more about yourself and what your gifts are and why you're here and what your purpose is. Thank you so much, Bryn. And I'm so sorry, my listeners, we are out of time. It's been a wonderful show. Bryn, what an absolute pleasure and delight to talk to you on Radio Tony today. And Willow wants us to know this is one of the most fun shows here. Thank you. We lo- I love doing what I do, and I think it's an absolute privilege to talk to people like Bryn every week and have you listeners interact and engage and learn something more about our world each week. Thank you so much, Bryn. I will be um, sure I'll be talking to you again soon. To all my listeners, thank you so much. This is Tony Lontis and you're listening to Radio Tony and that's it for this week.